Andrew Weissman, what do prosecutors on Jack Smith's team hear when they listen to this? Well, it's important for everyone to remember they have had this. In other words, we're learning about this, but they have the tape. And uh, knowing Jack Smith, they have interviewed everybody uh, other than the former president who was in that room. Uh, uh, so they, they have all of the information about uh, the tape recording, what happened in that room, and everyone's version of what they recall. Um, so you don't put something like this in, in, a, in a charging instrument unless you have this completely locked down. That's just how anybody and certainly how Jack Smith operates. Um, and so the big picture here, I think, for people is this is not a tape recording where we need to fly spec it. I mean, th this is game over if you are following the facts and the law. Um, he's charged with having classified information and knowing that he had classified information. He's not even charged with dissemination, that is, showing it to somebody. But even that can be proved. Um, and the tape recording is absolutely clear. This is a question now of simply, will the government get a trial uh, before the general election? Will a jury actually follow the law and the facts? And will the electorate follow the facts and care? Um, that's really what this is about. It is not about the facts. I mean, you have the former president on tape, um, and that's just one piece of evidence. And that just just think about the search. I mean, <laughs> like we're talking about a tape recording. That's, of course, great evidence if you're a prosecutor. But that's one piece of a massive mountain of evidence. So this really is not the case now about the facts. Andrew, I, I want to go to that point that Rachel raised when we were uh, talking about this, which is a point you have originally raised uh, publicly, the question of a possible separate prosecution of Donald Trump in New Jersey for what we just heard on that tape, which occurred in New Jersey. Yeah, so one of the things that Ryan Goodman, a professor at NYU, uh, one of my colleagues there, and I were struck by is that when you read the indictment, there's a information about so much information about Mar-a-Lago, and then you hear about documents being taken to Bedminster, and the story stops. There, there's sort of a, this sort of like hole where you sort of wonder why is there no more. Um, being told other than two instances of dissemination that occurred at Bedminster. Now, there could be various reasons. One of the things we posited was that it could lead to separate charges with respect to Bedminster, particularly since they knew that there was a good shot that they would get Judge Cannon in Florida. Were they thinking of this as a backup plan? The other is that they have venue issues, or they thought if things still go well in Florida, this is something that can certainly be brought up at sentencing upon conviction of the former president. In other words, you don't have to be charged with it in order for a judge to take it into account in sentencing. But it really is a possibility that it could happen, and it is a possible backup plan if they were to get really slowed down by adverse rulings and delay by Judge Cannon and appeals by Judge Cannon to the 11th Circuit, to the Supreme Court, um, that they have this other off-ramp with respect to what appears quite now to be very, very strong proof of not just retention, but dissemination in another district. Uh, Bradley Moss, you got to read most of what we just heard in the indictment, but not all. Now, having heard it, having heard everything that is uh, transcribed in the indictment and a little bit more of that dialogue, uh, what do you hear when you listen to those two minutes tonight? Laughter. That is quite possibly the most offensive part of all of this. I hear laughter. Hey, look what I've got. This document that the military gave to me that's still classified, probably at least top secret. Look at how cool this is. And let's joke about, you know, Hillary Clinton sending emails to Anthony Weiner. And by the way, bring me in a couple cokes. I hear recklessness. I hear laughter. 
And for anyone who's ever held a security clearance, for anyone who ever sat in a skiff and had to read through documents, for anyone who's ever, you know, been a subject to any kind of review and investigation over how they handle classified information, they probably feel what I feel right now, anger and being completely insulted by how this man handled it and how the staffers around him thought it was funny. This is not funny. These are classified documents. This is national defense information. It is not a joke. Yeah, as is uh, transcribed in the indictment, Donald Trump says he's talking about these documents. He says, isn't that amazing? Uh, and then he says, except it is like highly confidential and then laughter. Uh, and, and we tonight, uh, Andrew Weissman, for the first time, heard that laughter. And as Bradley Moss says, uh, it is so striking uh, when you see, as soon as Donald Trump tells them that this is highly confidential, everyone, including Trump, thinks that's very, very funny. Uh, one thing I'm wondering about in this indictment, uh, Andrew, is, is that transcript in this indictment on page 15 and 16 as much for the judge as anyone else uh, to make it clear to the judge at this stage, this is the kind of evidence that's going to be in this case. Uh, this is the kind of evidence that uh, is going to be in front of you, uh, what, it, Judge Cannon, if you try to throw out this case with a directed verdict. I think that's that's definitely one of the audiences. Uh, I do think that it is also just the American public. You have to remember this is the first federal indictment. Uh, and um, if you think about, go back to uh, the debate when Alvin Bragg brought his case, where people thought, oh, isn't it unfortunate that's the first case? And is it really serious en enough? Um, to, to really be the first case for any indictment of a former president. Um, and this really answers that question um, because of the strength of the case, but also to Brad's, I think, excellent point, which is that you understand why the Justice Department would be compelled to bring this case because of so many people who've done much less um, and the idea that a former president would act this irresponsibly with the lives of men and women in the intelligence community, but also to all of us. When, when people talk about national security, that is our security that is being discussed. And so I think that is the reason that you have such a clear so-called speaking indictment with this kind of evidence in it so that people understand why it had to be brought. Now, will there be a certain percentage of the population that does not hear that? Yes, but you can't, you can't lead your life based on that. Bradley Moss, do Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers uh, make a motion to strike this audio recording and that transcript from this trial in Florida, uh, saying that is a, that's stuff that happened in New Jersey? That cannot be included in this courtroom in Florida. Oh, I'm sure they'll try. They'll try to claim that the audio is inauthentic, that it's not complete. Uh, that it can't be authenticated, any number of things. Those are standard evidentiary pretrial motions, and I'm sure they'll try that. And I'm sure they'll fail. They, the Trump lawyers know what they're doing in the sense of they recognize the weaknesses in this case at this point. Todd Blanche, Chris Kyes, they understand how this is going to work. They never want this to make it to trial. If this makes it to trial, they're almost certain they lose. Their only hope is to get this case either thrown out or crippled in pre-trial motions. If they can do that, they have a chance, even just to delay this going to trial, as Andrew was noting, before the election. But if this gets to trial before the election, they're pretty certain, even in a conservative, deep red area of Florida, that there will likely be a conviction. They can't ever let this get to trial. Uh, Andrew, uh, we're gonna have to squeeze in a break here, but before we do, um, can Jack Smith establish possibly establish a chain of custody on this document that goes basically from Washington to Florida. And then Donald Trump, in the testimony, that we, the evidence we've already heard about of him ordering boxes onto planes at different times, then Donald Trump deliberately takes this document from Florida to New Jersey uh, and then uses it that way in New Jersey. Is that passage of that document through Florida enough to keep 
this audio and this document in this case? That would be one way to keep it. Um, but even if they couldn't establish that chain of custody, it would be enough to show his state of mind. Uh, and there'd be other reasons for this to come into evidence, even if they didn't have that transmission through um, Florida of this particular um, document. So there, there are many avenues for admissibility. I completely agree with Bradley that you know the defense lawyer's job is to make these motions. Um, if there's a 1% chance that they could prevail, they're going to make the motion. They can make any motion in good faith, and they should be making those motions. But I think any responsible judge is going to let this in.